Hello. My name is James Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in Orange County, California. And I'd like to take an opportunity to talk with you about a very serious issue that affects all of us in our country, and that is the issue of drug abuse in our society and our efforts to try to combat that critical issue. Now, what I'd like to do is use this opportunity first to address what we're doing and then hopefully to galvanize some thoughts to investigate the fact that we have some options. There are different ways that we can approach this very serious issue. What I'd like to do just as we begin is to ask you the same question that I ask basically wherever I go. And that is, how many of you feel that we in our society are doing better than we were five years ago with regard to the critical issue of drug use and abuse and all of the crime and misery that goes with it? Again, let me ask, how many of you out there feel that we in our country are in better shape today than we were five years ago with regard to this critical issue of drug use and abuse and all of the crime and misery that goes with it? Now, almost never do people raise their hands, and I can't see very many hands being raised now either. And those that would respond differently would agree probably that we're in better shape with regard to education, and that's true. We are making definite strides with regard to educating our young people and our not-so-young people with regard to this critical issue. But otherwise, I stand before you really without fear of contradiction in the belief that we are not in better shape today than we were five years ago. And if that's your view and you share it with me, then we have absolutely no legitimate expectation on believing that we'll be in better shape next year than we are now if we continue with the same programs. Well, what we need to do then is to figure out where we have been, where, what we have done that has been successful, what we have done that has not been successful, and of course what other countries around the world have done that have been successful and not successful, and try to come up with a program that is fit to meet our needs in our country. What have we done in the past? Well, what we have done is involve ourselves in a program through the criminal justice system of a massive program of prisons. And I believe, without real fear of contradiction, that this program of massive prisons has been and is a massive failure. You have seen, just as we began, a statement that we're spending somewhere between 20 and 25 thousand dollars to keep one person in custody for a year. You have also seen that we in the state of California have embarked upon a program of massive prison construction. We have built on the order of 12 new state prisons in the state of California in the last 10 years and more on the drawing board, another 10 before the year 2000. We are spending tens of millions of dollars to construct these prisons and then of course we're spending all of this money to to staff them and to utilize them and what do we have at the end of this time for all of these resources one wag said recently and i, I know he was an accountant uh, he says that by the year 2020, if we continue at the same pace, that literally everybody in the state of California will either be in prison or running one. It just doesn't make sense. For that same amount of money, we could take and treat on an outpatient basis about 40 people who are addicted to these dangerous drugs and at the end of that period of time have some expectation of making some progress. Now, what we need to do again is to realize that we can have options. We do have options about the way that we handle this enormously difficult problem. But let me set some ground rules and so we can understand each other and get to know each other a little bit better. There is no question in my mind that these drugs, for example, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana, are very dangerous drugs. I don't use them, I hope you don't use them, and I don't feel anyone should except under the hands of a medical doctor uh, who has expertise in the area. So I believe that these drugs are dangerous. However, they of course are available in any quantity in our country that anybody wants governed only by price. Issue number two, just to come to grips with, we must have more accountability, more responsibility in our society. And I believe both as a human being as well as a superior court judge that anybody that traffics in human misery for their own profit must be held accountable and must go to prison. That is my belief and I'll stand upon it. But wouldn't it be better to have a system that did not so dreadfully encourage people to be involved in the traffic of human misery? 
Are you aware, for example, that you and I, as taxpayers and as voters, because we have chosen to make these drugs illegal, have made cocaine the most lucrative crop in the history of man? Are you aware that marijuana today is the largest cash crop in the state of California, easily outdistancing number two, which is all dairy products, or number three, uh, which is an agricultural product, product, corn? This is a huge amount of revenue, and of course, it is untaxed. These drugs are fully as available in any quantity that anyone possibly could want, governed only by price. So what have we accomplished through this, other than the fact that we have involved ourselves in this massive program of prison construction, we really are spending our resources, I believe, in the wrong area. I am an optimist by heart. I truly believe that we have possible resolutions to all of our society's problems, and we have plenty of money, but we're not spending our money, not spending our resources as well as we should. What could we do instead? Well, we've already talked about the fact that you can take these monies and treat people on an outpatient basis and expect to have some form of beneficial result at the end. For example, when you're talking about drug treatment, you're not just talking about giving somebody a lecture, showing them some form of, of film on, on nutrition or physiology or health care. No, you're talking about efforts in self-esteem. You're talking about addressing the reasons why these people abused these drugs in the first place. You're also talking about job training and job skills, hopefully with a job at the end of that, to give somebody a reason why they want to get up in the morning, why they want to go out and work for a living and have that inestimable feeling of gratification that comes with a job and with having a place in this life. But what we're doing instead simply is not working. You can look at our inner cities, for example, today, and who are the role models that we have for our youth? Well, it is not, I fear to say, the people that work very hard during the day and then go to school at the night in an effort to better him or herself. These are not the role models for our youth. Unfortunately, you know as well as I who they are. They're people that are wearing the gold jewelry, people that reach into their pockets for pocket change and give $300 to their mother to pay rent for the next month out of drug proceeds. And these are the people, the drug pushers, that are the role models for our inner city youth today as well as the youth virtually everywhere else. So what we're doing is not working. And it's not working for large numbers of reasons. And we don't have enough time to go through all of them, but you can talk about economics, you can talk about medical issues, you can talk about health, human issues, and everything else. They all boil down to the fact that what we are doing in our beloved country simply is not working. We have filled the court system, and I can speak to that very directly. We have certainly filled our jails, we have certainly filled our prisons, and we're talking about trying to increase all of these institutions without the money to pay for it. So it is time to come to a reasonable assessment on trying to figure out a better way. Well, what could these better ways be? Let me tell you first that it is okay to talk about this subject. It is perfectly example, perfectly appropriate to speak with your family members, your friends, your peers, and anywhere else about these particular subjects. And just because you and I are talking right now about this critically important issue does not mean that we condone drugs under any way, shape, or form. But since these matters affect all of us, in fact, those of us that do not use these drugs have become victims of this war on drugs. Any of you, for example, that have bars in your home, over your windows, burglar alarm systems in your cars or your homes, you are victims of the drug war. Are you aware, for example, that 80% of all felony crime in Southern California is drug-related crime? That means that 60% of all felony cases in Southern California are drug crimes which is, basically means the sale of drugs, the possession of drugs for sale, or the uh, violence that goes along with the manufacture and distribution of these illicit drugs. 
an additional 20% of all felony crime is what we call drug-related. And that means the burglaries, the purse snatchings, the other things that people who are drug addicted do to get the money in order to purchase these drugs. And so once again, about 80% of our felony crime in the state of California or in Southern California is drug-related crime. Now, please don't have me come across to you by saying that by changing our approach, we're going to get rid of crime. That will never happen. We have never had a crime-free society. We never will. We have never had a drug-free society. We never will. But we must try to understand that if these drugs are harmful, and they truly are, what we should do is take an overall approach to try to reduce the harm that necessarily flows from the abuse of these drugs. What can we do? Well, for example, you can look at the AIDS epidemic, which is truly that. It is an epidemic. And if you're interested in a crime, let me tell you a crime that is being perpetrated upon our own people. In Holland, for example, where they have a program recognizing that these drugs are harmful and have gone to a program of harm reduction, they furnish clean needles on a needle exchange program to the people that are going to use these drugs anyway. People in Holland about, that use these drugs have about 5% addiction rate, uh, or excuse me, 5% of the people who are addicted to these drugs are HIV positive or have the AIDS virus. In the United States of America, and again, here is the crime, about 35% of our drug addicted people who inject are HIV positive. This is absolutely unconscionable, and it is avoidable. So these are things that we need to look at with regard to the overall problem that we have inflicted upon ourselves in many ways because of this drug problem. Other problems, of course, are, and I'm not a medical doctor. I don't purport to have that form of expertise. But pharmacologists and medical doctors tell me that there are definite medical usages for many of these presently illicit drugs. And if you are a medical doctor, you really fear for your license, as well as all the bureaucracy to keep, that, that keeps you actually from being able to prescribe these medications to people who are in pain and who are in need of those particular medications. This, I believe, is another crime and something that we, as a purportedly interested and human society, should allow medical doctors to make these decisions instead of police officers. Let's look at what we are doing to ourselves. Let's look at the fact, again, that even though these drugs are as illegal as they can be under our present Constitution and under our statutes, they are fully as available in any quantity that you possibly could want, again, governed only by price. Are we concerned about our people? Of course we are. We do not lack in a commitment to try to help our people and to stem the tide. We must readjust our focus. And how can we do that? By investigating this entire issue and all of the ramifications, the violence, the economics, and all of the rest. We are members of a group called the National Coalition for Drug Policy Change. And please join with us by signing a resolution. The resolution states what we have already agreed upon, namely that what we're doing under the criminal justice system simply is not working and then recommending to our president and our Congress to appoint one final blue ribbon commission to investigate this entire area as publicly as possible, as fully as possible, and then to make recommendations to us as to our options. What those options are, uh, there are many. Uh, we can look around the world, we can look inwardly, we can try to come up with other options. And again, just to reiterate, just because we're exploring our options, just because we prove or choose to use a different option, does not at all mean that we condone the usage of drugs. Will our young people understand if, for example, today these drugs are illegal and tomorrow they are not illegal under a different system for adults? And the answer is, of course they will. Just because cigarettes are not illegal for adults does not at all mean that our government condones their usages, even though, parenthetically, I tell you, as you're aware, that our government pres presently is subsidizing uh, this very addictive drug, namely tobacco. 
But if you're looking for victims in our drug war, if you're looking for institutions and people who have been harmed, let me suggest one to you that maybe you have not focused on. Now what that might be is the police. Have you thought for a moment what it would be like to be a law enforcement officer and not have this problem visited upon you that you are supposed to resolve, namely drug use and abuse in our society? Can you imagine what your life would be like as a law enforcement officer, as a peace officer, mind you, if you didn't have to enforce the unenforceable? And I tell you that one of the major victims of the drug war is the police on the one hand and their relations with the communities that they're trying to serve on the other. And we have all of these police forces who legitimately have community relations organizations and committees trying to get along with the people that they're trying to represent and assist. And then we have yet some other conflict some a drug arrest gone awry, some asset forfeiture case that is viewed in many ways rightfully as an unconscionable exercise of government power. And you have all of these efforts by the police going down the drain because they're trying to enforce the unenforceable. This whole area does not really lend itself to sound bites. You can't end up on the 6 o'clock news for 30 seconds and come out with some little slogan that will tell our people the depth of, and the, the whole area of this problem. But one of them comes modestly close, and let me share that with you. And that is as follows. If you want to keep getting what you're getting, keep doing what you're doing. Now what we are getting right now is a whole bunch of people who are hardcore addicts. Let's call them what they are. They are addicted to these drugs and they're going out and prostituting themselves, burglarizing, hitting people over the head at ATMs and all of the rest to get money to purchase these drugs. And we are getting a situation in which of course our courts are beyond being overcrowded and so are our jails and so are our prisons. What are we doing to keep getting what we're getting? More of the same. What we tried before did not work. We tried to encourage people, in fact, we tried to use the hammer to keep people from using these drugs by threatening to put them in prison. And in fact, that is what we have done. And numbers of judges, just like me, have put people in prison for ever longer periods of time. If it didn't work to sentence them to two years in prison, let's make a mandatory sentence of five years in prison. And then we look around and two or three years later and see, good heavens, it isn't working. We're doing worse now than we were before, so let's make it 10 years. Let's even make it 15 years, etc. We have increased the draconian punishments and it still is not working. We are still getting, as such, a lot worse situation and result than when we began. And the answer is not to re continue to, to bring in larger penalties for these people. Sheriff Michael Hennessy of San Francisco recently wrote an article for American Jails magazine, not exactly a flamingly liberal publication. It goes out nationwide to sheriffs and others who run our nation's jails. And Sheriff Hennessy came out with a statement that I think is really exactly correct. And that is, there is a definite limit to the benefit to chase drug addicts and fill our jails and prisons with them and expect to make any particular progress. We have done that for the last number of decades and it simply has not worked. And we as the criminal justice professionals, as they call themselves, we in law enforcement must tell the public exactly that. And his message has gone forward nationwide to the law enforcement jailers of our nation. And I think he is certainly to be commended. That voice has been joined by numbers of other people around the country. We have, for example, the sheriffs of, uh, or of uh, San Francisco, Sheriff Hennessy, who has signed our resolution. We have had mayors of, for example, the cities of San Francisco, Upland, Oakland, San Jose, that have signed our resolution. We as well have, have the chiefs of police of those same cities, San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland, who have signed the resolution calling for the full exploration and investigation of this entire area. 
Can you join with us and sign the resolution? Yes, you can. And if you are interested, please send a self-addressed stamped envelope to me. My name is Judge James Gray at the Orange County Superior Court in Santa Ana, California. Make it please a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'm going broke trying to furnish postage. But I will send a copy of our resolution to you as well as some further thoughts about the investigation of possible change. There is so much to talk about. What we need to do is to educate ourselves nationwide about this entire area. Do you realize, though, that not only did people simply recoil from a discussion about this issue, but they equate the discussion with condoning the usage of drugs? And that simply, flat out, is not true. Again, education is critically important, but be mindful that we are making progress with regard to educating our people about all of these areas, including the most dangerous and addictive drug in our society today, which is tobacco. We are making progress with regard to that. About 1% of the people that smoke tobacco in our country per year are putting aside their cigarettes and calling it quits. Why? Because we've made it illegal? Because we have sent them to prison? Of course not. But because society is changing its approach. The way you contradict or contraact drug abuse in our society is culturally, is educationally, and that is what we must look to, of course, to continue this fight. We must also understand that the use of alcohol in our society is declining. Uh, the use of hard alcohol is being reduced. Why? Because we have again made alcohol illegal. No, we tried that once. Let's remember that we tried that experiment and it simply did not work. Let's remember that there used to be enormous violence in our country with regard to the manufacture and distribution of alcohol. Is there now? No. Because why? We have no longer made this drug illegal. We have made this available under a program of, in effect, the regulated distribution of alcohol to adults. Now, we still have serious problems with regard to the abuse of alcohol, without any doubt. But the answer, whatever it might be, is certainly not, again, to make alcohol illegal. What we are doing now is embarked upon a program in our country for decades of drug prohibition. And just like alcohol prohibition did not work, drug prohibition is not working either. So, for example, if you're not interested in investigating what our options are and signing the resolution to inquire about our options, maybe you would be interested at least in investigating what we're doing now, which is drug prohibition. And if you're not interested in that, then I regret to have to say to you, why? What do you have to fear? Why do you not want or agree to investigate this entire area? And that is an answer that I think is enlightening. There are so many things to talk about. And I don't have uh, uh, too much time because there are so many things to cover. But let me share one little thought with you. There was a man who said, you know, when my grandmother turned 74 years old, she started walking five miles a day. Now she's 77 and we haven't the faintest idea where she is. Well, in a very similar fashion, you and I, for whatever reason, decided a few decades ago to make these drugs illegal. And I propose to you right this minute that we haven't the faintest idea where these laws have taken us. It is time for us to assess. It is time for us to stop and look into this entire situation. Maybe when we investigate this before a Blue Ribbon Neutral Commission, uh, hopefully on C-SPAN or some cable network where we all can look at the evidence and consider the evidence as it's suggested. Maybe we can learn that from a historical standpoint, these drugs were not made illegal, particularly for any uh, criminal or any form of medical problems or any form of safety problems. They were basically made illegal because of economic competition and because of racism. We don't have time to go into that so much now. But look, for example, at the whole issue of hemp. Now, hemp is the stock of the marijuana plant. As maybe many of you know, maybe many of you do not. But hemp was a thriving industry throughout our colonial period, all until about the early 1930s. 
and it can, for example, furnish enormous benefits. You can think that the diesel engine was designed to run on the oil from the hemp plant. You can look at, for example, the fact that you can make the same amount of paper pulp from an acre of hemp as it takes for three acres of trees. And it takes 20 years to grow the trees. It takes only one season to grow the hemp. So there are numbers of issues here. I don't have all of these answers, but we certainly should explore them. Because in my view, we made marijuana illegal, which is the leaf of the marijuana of the hemp plant. We made it illegal for economic reasons that had nothing to do with health or safety. So there are many things to talk about. And let me just leave you with one final thought. And that is another story that someone said recently where a man was on his deathbed and at the very end he called his, his wife to his side and said, Dear, I know I'm not long for this earth, but before I leave you, I just have to tell you something. And that is that for a number of years now I've been having an affair with such and such a woman that lives across the street. And I'm sorry to hurt your feelings, but I think you have a right to know. She looked at him for a moment, she stopped, and then she said, I know. That's all right. That's why I poisoned you. Well, in so many ways, my fellow friends, what we're doing with regard to our drug laws is poisoning ourselves. It's time to look into it. It's time to investigate it. It's time to realize that we have options at our disposal. And then it's time, to, after this investigation, to change our course. Thank you for listening. You can help by thinking about this issue, by talking about it, by writing to your Congress people, Help support H.R. 3100 in Washington that would appoint this neutral commission. Write your legislators, talk about it, and if you're willing, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope. You too can join us in this effort. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you.